So last time we basically finished the Schwarzschild space time, uh, the global <coughs> structure and the beautiful interplay between physics and geometry of the Kruskal extension of the Schwarzschild space time. And so, just from last time then, the Kruskal extension. <coughs> so we saw that the global picture of the, the structure of space time is that we got this line u equal to zero, v equal to zero, these are classical times up here, and then we got a singularity, and so the singularity there is this, r equal to zero, the u times v equal to one, uh, this is the singularity up here, and these are, this is an asymptotic region, this would be the black hole region. This is the another asymptotic region. <coughs> and this is a full classical extension we saw. And I mentioned at the, at the very end that, however, this is the mathematical extension of the full Schwarzschild space time. In classical general relativity, we don't expect it to be, uh, to, to be realized in nature. We expect that you are given some initial data, like a star or something like that, that collapses and forms a black hole. And therefore, there really isn't a white hole region. There's only a the asymptotic region, the black hole region. So if you actually have a collapse, and the picture is that you've got a star up here. You know, the star is, so this is the world line of the star, as, sorry, the world tube of the star. So star is, um, is something like sitting up here, the world tube of the star. Time is running like that and this is sort of the spatial cross-section of the star. And then at once, some stage, the star collapses, <coughs> star collapses, and forms a singularity. So this is like our, this is like our r equal to zero singularity over there. We use the same chart, same color. And then the statement is that there is a corresponding horizon that is formed. So this is like u equal to zero line so the, and then this region up here with a black hole region like that and this region is just an asymptotic region so from here the signals can go the light rays can go out so this is the outgoing light ray and then there are infalling light rays infalling light rays will fall into the singularity the outlook outgoing light rays will just go out to infinity so only the region so it's the only region one up here and region two are, will actually be realized in nature. Uh, this is just a mathematical extension of the full of the region one that we have got. So that is the, the situation with classical general relativity. The idea is that you are given some time t equal to zero up here, some initial data, and we evolve. This is this is r equal to zero. This is some star radius r equal to r naught. But this r naught depends on time because the star collapses. Uh, it collapses, it reaches zero radius. Makes a, makes a singularity, and this is the kind of picture that we have. So these two are considered to be mathematical extensions, do not have direct physical meaning. On the other hand, in many quantum field theory considerations, or considerations that involve <coughs> um, uh, uh, black hole thermodynamics and so on, one often considers the total global region that we have got. So now, what we want to understand, today's talk is really about the, the next topic, I think it's topic four, point four, topic four, which is what is a black hole. So we just saw this one's simplest example, and now we want to know what is a black hole in general. So the idea is it's the same that we saw before, namely, would like it to be the case that there's a region in space-time from which signals, you know, causal signals cannot be sent out to infinity. That region is what we would like to call black holes. So, for example, the same picture now I draw, the collapsing star picture, I draw here. You, all these pictures you will see in books and papers, so it's good to be familiar with them. So the idea up here is again I got some star. So this is a world tube of star. So this is the world tube up here. This is what the ball here 
is what the star looks like at an instant of time. And then the star actually under, so, uh, I mean, uh, time is running like that. Say so coordinate time is like, running like this. And space is these cross sections. Uh, these two directions are space. And this is time. Um, this is the kind of the time coordinate, so to say, is running. And here, um, this is the star is static. And here, picture is very much like the Gaskell space. This really is a time like direction. This really is space like section and so on. But then, supposing the star actually undergoes a collapse, okay. and therefore this is r equal to zero now. r equal to zero line was that. This was the radius of the star. It collapses, forms a star. r equal to zero. And then there is a singularity. So in this picture, <laughs> different from this picture, singularity really is going to be space-like. But in this picture, we're not worrying about space-like time-like character. This really is as a coordinate time. And then this was r equal to zero line. So in coordinate picture. This r equal to zero line would just look like, like that. This would be r equal to zero line. So this really is a much more faithful diagram because you see that space-like line is really space-like here. Should not this this is not faithful for the causal structure of space-time. This looks like a time-like line, but it's actually space-like. It's just a coordinate time. Uh, so r equal to zero. And then the statement is the following: that supposing this is what happens. Then what happens is that if you are very far away from the star, then the metric is going to like a Minkowski metric. And as you know, in Minkowski metric, space-time, the light cones are just like that. The, 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 at any point, there is a future light cone, there is a past light cone. The, these are the, the light rays that are emitted and so on. But as you come closer and closer to the star, because of the gravitational attraction of the light rays, these light cones start bending. Until there is some surface, that is formed, and this surface is again the horizon. <coughs> so this horizon is really this surface up here, which is the horizon, is, is, is the analog of this surface up here, horizon, or this, this future horizon up here. Because you've got both a black hole and a white hole, there's a future horizon and a past horizon. For black hole, there's <coughs> relevant, this is future horizon. So this horizon is like that. We know that every point up here is a two sphere, and here it is a little bit more manifest. So you see that this is, of course, it looks like a circle, but for one dimension suppressed, so it looks like it's a two sphere. So that is a horizon. And then what happens is that as the light cones start tipping, as we come closer to the star, that goes tip out at infinity, they are straight, like in Minkowski space. So light cones start tipping. And then here, the light cones just tip completely. So all the future directed light rays are directed like that towards the singularity. So they, they don't escape to infinity. All the future directed light rays are tracked in this particular region. And this region is then the black hole region. Uh, Because oh, for a, any point up here, the future directed light rays are not going out. Or here, this is going in, but this is going out. This is outgoing. Or here, the outgoing light ray is like that, and the ingoing light rays are like that. So all of them are trapped in this region. So this region up here is black hole region or trapped region. from which causes signals will not be able to escape. So that is what the intuitive picture is. Right? There's still a heuristic intuitive as to what is the black hole region, but it's a region from which <coughs> causal signals will not go out to in the asymptotic region. But to make this, this whole thing precise, we need a notion of what you mean by asymptotic region. So the, the key question now is, what is asymptotic region? And that is the, the, the big digression that we have to make in order to define black hole, to define precisely what a symptotic region is. This notion was introduced already in the 60s by Penrose. Around 65 to 67. Um, 
And this notion of asymptotic, what you mean by asymptotic region, asymptotic flatness and so on, is important, plays an important role in many, many different contexts. It's going to let, let us define what a black hole is. It is also in the context of quantum black holes. This is also enables us to define what you mean by asymmetrics. And one of the fundamental question about quote unquote information loss in the quantum evaporation of the black hole is whether the S matrix is unitary and to define S matrix we have to define Hilbert spaces of asymptotic states and again this notion of asymptotic region is what is used and quite apart from black hole classical and quantum black hole region which is, uh, physics the this notion of asymptotic flatness is a bedrock on which the entire theory of gravitational radiation and gravitational waves underlies. So when people do numerical simulations, what they are trying to achieve is really this asymptotically flat space times, and then as we're talking, going to talk in a minute about certain boundaries of these asymptotic space times. That is where the gravitational radiation is actually extracted in a meaningful way. So it plays a role in many, many different contexts, and that is why I want to take a little more time to explain this in, in some detail. So this is what we now want to talk about. <coughs> what is asymptotic region? So this is a notion. So again, to get our intuition straight, we always start with Minkowski space time, which we have good intuition about. And then in this Minkowski space time, of course, all flat, but still, we would like to know what is asymptotic region, how do I do physics there. For example, I may have Maxwell fields in Minkowski space time. I would like, we would like to talk about what is radiation, how much energy is carried by, by Maxwell fields and so on. And that is all much, made much more precise in, in terms of this uh, construction uh, due to Penrose. So in Minkowski space time, the standard metric is just given by minus dt squared plus dr squared plus r squared times the angular part. And we, what we are interested in Minkowski spacetime is to go in the far away region in the null direction. Because for black holes, it is because <coughs> we want to know, in fact, which, which part of spacetime is visible from infinity. And to know about which is visible from infinity, what we need is to go, in the, go away in the null direction up here. If you are looking at radiation, again, Roughly, the radiation propagates in the null directions, and therefore, again, if you take a ride, take a ride on the light front, that light front will take you to, uh, to in the asymptotic region in null directions. So, therefore, what we introduce is this future directed null, uh, retarded null coordinate, u is equal to t minus r. So, u could be not our future uh, magnitude six. You could u not, and then. Um, theta phi, so constant. <coughs> These are future energy cases. These are lines. U equal to constant is a line. If you just allow theta and phi both, then U equal to constant will give you a, a null form. So if I got a point in the Minkowski space, then U equal to U naught will be this null form future directed null cone. And therefore, what you want to do is to keep u constant. <coughs> so if I go in, if I take this point and go further in time, so time is again really like this, in the Minkowski space. If I take a future directed, uh, uh, another point up here to the future of the first point, then, so this is point one, this is point two, but again, I'll get a so u equal to u one. So this point is say naught, and this point is say one. So this will be u equal to u naught, this u equal to u one. That's going to be again another light cone that goes out there. So u equal to constant are these null cones. That are that. And the idea up here is that we are taking a ride along these null geodesics, going in all possible directions, and we want to know where do we reach. And the point of, about this construction is really, so to say, we, we, are, we would like to look, look at where do these null geodesics end, so to say. So where do they find the resting place, the final <coughs> resting place? Now, of course, in the physical space time, there is no final resting place. As you go along here, r is going to infinity, and you just go u equal to constant, and r going to infinity. Right? So you arrive at r equal to infinity, then you just at that infinity. But the whole idea of this construction is that we want to bring this infinity at a finite distance by conformal transformation, by rescaling of the metric. And if you bring it to the finite distance, 
so, so that infinity becomes a, a boundary to the physical space-time, then we can do uh, uh, di local differential geometry on this boundary. And instead of taking limits r equal to infinity and worrying about whether some differentiation will commit a limit and so on, finally we're just do taking, uh, look, doing, going to be able to do local differential geometry on, on this boundary which represents r equal to infinity. So we want to bring r equal to infinity to finite distance now. So instead of going to infinity, we want to bring it at a finite distance. So that this will be u equal to u naught, this will be, sorry, u equal to u1 up here, then I'll get here u equal to u naught. So we would like to bring this, so this is, so to say, r equal to infinity, this surface. And the question is, how do we find this surface up here? That's what we're trying to do. So we just go ahead up here, where I've done the metric in terms of u coordinate. So we eliminate t, t is going to be called u plus r, therefore ds squared will just look like minus du squared minus times du dr. And when I take du, dt squared as du plus dr squared, I get a, because of the minus sign, I get minus dr squared, so that cancels this. I understand that we left with d minus r squared d omega squared. So this is the metric, and this is the same Minkowski metric, signature minus d squared <coughs> plus. The known and, the, and it is really uh, the, the same flat metric up here. Um, and now what we want to do is to go to uh, go to infinity at uh, along, uh, r equal to infinity along a u equal to u naught. So we introduce a new coordinate, call it omega, which is one upon r. So omega equal to zero at r equal to infinity. And the idea is that we would like to express everything in terms of now u u equal to constant, theta equal to constant, phi equal to constant, and r going to infinity, which is the same as omega going to zero. So that's what we're trying to do here. So this r equal to infinity is going to be the new coordinate omega equal to zero. So we want to get away from a coordinate which is not very useful for us, r, and we want to bring in a new coordinate which is just one upon r, so that we can do, so that r equal, uh, omega equal to zero would be the boundary that we're looking at. So when I do that, I just get here ds squared minus <coughs> du squared minus du dr. You just substitute and you get here plus twice du, du omega upon omega squared. And r squared just becomes uh, 1 upon omega squared times du omega squared. But this r squared is 1 upon capital omega squared because of omega is 1 upon r. So we find this at Minkowski metric. And of course, the problem is that if I take the omega equal to zero limit, these metric coefficients blow off. It is just a reflection of the fact that if I go out to infinity along r equal to constant, uh, I, I'm sorry, u equal to u naught and r equal to to infinity, and if I look at any two null geodesics, for example, theta and phi, then the distance between them is growing linearly, just a straight linear, and therefore that distance between them becomes infinite, and that is a problem that is happening here. So the metric becomes, metric is always bad at r equal to infinity because r equal to infinity is not a part of the manifold, so it's not a good, good coordinate. <coughs> r equal to, r is not a good coordinate at r equal to infinity. So what we do now is really that we introduce a conformally rescale metric. It's a mathematical metric, but it has the same physical information as a physical metric. So we introduce a new metric, which is conformally rescale, which is rescaled by a, by, by a factor, so which we call d has d is hat squared, and with this, just take, take it to be equal to omega squared uh, d s squared. So omega is called conformal factor, and that was just the coordinate one upon r, if you like. Now, then the statement is that this looks perfectly fine, that looks like minus omega squared du squared plus, from here, plus twice du d omega, and then omega, one upon omega squared cancels, so I get d omega squared. So d omega squared is just a unit <coughs> sphere metric. It is just d theta squared plus sine squared theta d phi squared. D u, d u, d omega is perfectly well defined. Therefore, at omega equal to zero, which was the r equal to infinity. So r is a bad coordinate to, at, 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 when it takes infinity value. So now omega is a good coordinate at, at, at that boundary. And then 
we find that at omega equal to zero, this term goes away, and I just left it du d omega times du d omega squared. Now you might be first worried that if this term goes away, that means the metric becomes degenerate, but that is not the case. You can just see that this, this is du d omega, and therefore the metric is actually not degenerate. If you like, I got theta phi directions. In the theta phi direction, the metric is just unit two sphere metric, there's no problem. In the RT directions, Okay, which is the same as u omega direction, the metric will take the value 1, 0, 1, 1, 0 in, in, in this uh, d omega direction. Uh, this is du d omega, that's what it looks like. And therefore, we can see that here it is not degenerate, right? Because this determinant is equal to, it's not equal to 0. Okay, so this metric is perfectly well defined at omega equal to 0. So the statement is that we have a regular. And does have signature minus plus 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 as before. So we don't change the signature. All we have done is to absorb the bad behavior <laughs> of the R, R coordinate at R equal to infinity. It's nothing, it is badly behaved because it's R equal to infinity by conformally scaling with respect to this omega. So we get this this man this this uh, boundary very well. So so this is the boundary that it is written up here. If I were to draw a picture that we often draw like here where every point is a two sphere except this line, this is r equal to zero line, the origin, every point here is just a point, r equal to zero, but every point here, <coughs> r equal to r naught, is a two sphere of radius r naught. So if I draw that, then what I'm doing is, what I did up here is the following, u equal to u naught, where this null raised, and I've added the end points of this null geodesics, and this is, the, thus I have taken a, um, surface up here, and this surface is just omega equal to zero, at which the null geodesics is exact. So we have found, so to say, the final resting place of all null geodesics. Every point up here represents the end point of one null geodesic. That is what this is. And this is, Penrose, Roger, uh, um, denoted it, this by script i, and then <coughs> came to be known as scry. Scry just stands for script i. There's no. So this is a boundary. So scry, or let me call it scry plus, is a future boundary. Of, of, the, of space time, which we obtained by conformal completion. And so I got a manifold now. This m hat, this is the Minkowski <coughs> space manifold together with a boundary, which is I call sky plus, and I've got a metric g hat ab, which is omega squared g ab, which is well defined everywhere. So m hat is a manifold with a boundary. What is the nature of this boundary? Well, this is u equal to u naught, this will be u equal to u1. And each of these two points, each of the points up here is a two sphere. Right? This is a, this is two, 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 each of these points up here is a two sphere up here, um, labeled by theta and phi, labeled by theta and phi up here. And therefore, the topology of this is two sphere times r. The r direction is a u direction, and two sphere direction is just the two sphere direction which goes around. In this picture, the two sphere direction you see every barrier, and r and the, the real r direction there is just coordinatized by u. u goes from minus infinity to infinity. So this is the r direction is coordinated by u, which takes values between minus infinity and infinity. So it's a cylinder, the boundary that we're attached to space time. Now, of course, there's nothing special about going to future. We could also look at past geodesics, right? just as we have done in future direct direction. So if you went to the past, then we'll define V to, to be equal to uh, T plus R, just as U was T minus R. This is going to be equal to V equal to V naught, geodesics of here. And again, I do this very similar construction, and I'll, I'll find uh, just interchanging uh, U, uh, U and V. The only difference that happens is that instead of T U D omega, you'll get minus uh, twice D V D omega. And that minus sign is because V is given by T minus R, whereas U was given by T plus R. So you'll just get a metric up here again, BS, BS hat square, 
to be equal to, to minus um, times dv squared minus twice dv to omega. All this is in the nodes, so you know you can look at and uh, do the uh, all the algebra that, that you need to do. Do it in the nodes. So it's the same thing that we can define that this new metric is hat square, which is going to be uh, <coughs> given to us in this particular way. And therefore, we can again also introduce here the pass boundary. And this pass boundary is called sky minus. <coughs> this is the pass boundary. Each of them has topology of S2 cross R, and this is what we have. Now, these boundaries, as I've written down up here, they don't meet. Uh, also, u equal the point up here, u becomes infinity. Here, u go, go, goes to minus infinity. Here, v goes to infinity, and here v goes to minus infinity. And so, u equal to infinity, v equal to infinity. These are not points in our chart. Therefore, the, these things don't meet. They just sort of, they, they come close, but they don't meet completely. And this is a picture where, um, if time allows today. No, I probably don't allow. I, I'll do some uh, a completion, which will, be, which will also include these points, which is important not so much for black holes, but for many mathematical physics problems in general relativity. For example, the, the completion where, where these points are included is used, was, was used first to show that in Minkowski space, young mill solutions, uh, solutions to young mill situations have global ex unique and ex uniqueness in existence. In other words, if you give me initial data, then I get a solution everywhere in the Minkowski space. That was done by using this conformal compactification, which I will do perhaps next time. Okay, so I got this, uh, 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 this metric up here. Okay, so we understand this Minkowski metric, and therefore now what we want to say is that, well, this is the boundary, so what we should do is, we should look at the region to come back to black holes, we should look at the region from which causal signals can be sent to infinity, to future infinity. Which means that I have to look at all the region from which causal signals can be sent out to infinity, so I have to look at past of this future infinity. <coughs> and the question is, if I look at, so the region from which causal signal can be sent to infinity, is precisely the causal path of this infinity. And then the question is, is the causal path of this infinity the whole space-time, or is something missing? If something is missing, then that is a black hole. For example, in this, in this case, uh, we're not done it yet, we'll do it today. Um, in this collapsing case, up here, we'll have sky, which will look like that, sky plus. And if I look at the causal past, I will get with this region. And then the question is, is this the whole space-time? Well, no, because signals from this region, signals from this region, this region 2 up here, will never go to scrap. All the future directed signals are falling to singularity. Therefore, this region is not in the causal past of scrap here. And therefore, this is a black hole region. So, to summarize, the idea is, you try to construct what you mean by asymptotic region by add, adding a boundary to space-time. And then the statement is that when you add that boundary to space-time, you look at its causal past. Is it all of space-time? If yes, no black hole. If it is not all of space-time, then there's a black hole. In Minkowski space, of course, if I take the few, the, this causal past and look at this, I get the entire <coughs> space-time, all this u equal to constant lines from u equal to plus infinity to equal to minus infinity, I get entire space time. So of course there's no black hole in Minkowski space. So uh, this is the idea. So the, the problem in the black hole to do a, to, to get a complete future boundary in some sense, it comes from the geodesic incompleteness or, or something like that, that there's no conformal rescaling of the metric in the black hole region that allows to glue a future boundary there in, in Anyway. Right, but I mean the thing is that we, we look precisely here at, at outgoing null direction, and the statement is that these outgoing null directions will oh, not reach here. They, they would even yeah. will not even reach here. I mean, forgetting about whether you can put a boundary here, they will just not reach here at all. So, therefore, you you ask sky, you look at past of sky. If there is a region from which 
there are no null geodesics which <laughs> there. So it's quite up independently of the fact that that you, we will not be able to accept the conformal completion here. Even if you can do conformal completion here, the statement is that regions from here will that will be another boundary up here. This is not so, so it is in principle possible, but it would not be the one reached by null. Uh, uh, by this null. Okay, so the statement up here is that I'm not saying that. Um, uh, maybe we should we can come back again. I'm not saying that it's possible, but I'm saying that the logical conformal <laughs> is different. The yeah. logical here is that from this region, if I look at the null rays, they all go into the into the singularity. None of them goes to infinity. And by going by looking at infinity and by going past up here, then the statement is that uh, by by looking at it past, we just miss out this region. Okay, maybe we should write down the next definition and then we can come back to this point again. Okay. So this is Minkowski space. So now this is the intuition. So we are under the notion of general notion of blackness. This, this is what you want to know. So suppose, so we are given a physical space-time, like for example the short space-time, but it could be a star, it could be you know, rotating star, it could be some, any, any space-time that you give me. So uh, given a space-time, a physical space-time, MGAB is said to be is said to be asymptotically um, flat. There exists um, space time which is larger m hat j hat a b where m hat <coughs> is a manifold boundary, m hat is a manifold boundary, and m hat is just equal to m together with a boundary. So it's, it's obtained by adding up some completion up here um, in that, um, such that where, where this is the thing and with star being a topology is two plus one. Um, and G hat AB is conformally related to the physical metric GAB, but only on the manifold F. So on the boundary, boundary sky here of M hat, G hat AB will be well defined, but G is not well defined because um, omega equal to zero, and this hat on equality will always mean equality in the boundary. <coughs> Equality just at the boundary point scribe here. So such that omega is equal to zero and gradient omega is not equal to zero. Now where all where do these all conditions come from? I have to continue. But let's understand first here. <coughs> so bigger manifold, this bigger manifold is precisely the one that we had here from Minkowski space. Minkowski space together with scribe is a bigger manifold. The conformal factor is one of is omega up here. And then the, and then we're doing and the, then the statement is that the conformal factor omega was was one upon r in physical space time. The condition that omega is zero but gran omega is not equal to zero 
these conditions intuitively, so I should use another hammer, um, intuitively these conditions just mean, these two conditions just mean that heuristically omega is going to <coughs> If omega went to as 1 upon r squared, then grand omega is also 0, but grand grand omega will not be 0. If it went as 1 upon r cube, then you, know, you just keep going. Okay. So this is, this is what is it. And so these are the certainties that I did not want to enter into when I talked about you know, what happens here if you could do completion. So the statement is that the various conditions we are writing down now cannot be achieved during a completion which will also include this region. You still look puzzled. So, so I, I just want to see the precise uh, reason that if if we would um, look at a special well, a sum slice that contains a point in the <coughs> region in, in region two, and there we would try to look at a, li uh, a light ray that goes up to the singularity. Um, that it is impossible to define a future point. So, so you're saying this, this is the reason why... Uh, the, at this condition and the condition I'm writing down now, more and more conditions I'm going to write down, those conditions will not be satisfied uh, at this point. So. I see. And so <coughs> the statement of, of the, the definition here is saying, um, I, I try to do this procedure to get as much of a future boundary as yeah, I can. And, and that is the point. And then I look at the past. And, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, that's the point I'm going to about it. So for example, we're going to see, I'm running ahead of myself, but we're going to see in a minute that in fact these conditions that I'm writing down will imply that the boundary is now. So it's not me. So, I, so it's not just one thing. The package cannot be, that conformable completion cannot be applied to this. Yeah. You have a question. Yeah, what does that equal sign with the scribble on top? Yeah, so, so this just means, with a, with a half, it, it just means that this equality is just at points of scry, at that points of the boundary of, the, of this boundary oh, okay. here. So, and we'll use that just in sort of writing every time that this is true only at scry. So this hat just means this equality holds. Equality, so this is equality. <coughs> equality just at points of scry, at the boundary. Do I incorporate? I mean, it's somewhat surprising that at the end, the definition is rather simple. Uh, I'll, I'll just tell you a little bit more about this. So it says, we say that it can be such a thing. You've got original space-time, and there's a conformally completed space-time. The boundary is just S2 cross R. And the metric is given by, is conformally related. The conformal factor satisfies these particular conditions. Um, um, So I got now give some some I think there's only one condition. Yeah. Just so we take I stand tensor. So this I stand is a physical metric. This is a Ricci tensor, and this is the scalar curvature of curvature scalar, and this, so this is a definition. And Einstein's equation just tells us, and I put capital G equal to one for most of the lectures, so this is just equal to the space and tensor, such that omega to the minus two times T A B has a regular limit. At the boundary scry. Remember, omega goes to zero at scry. Therefore, omega to the minus two blows up at scry. So, for this to have regular limit, TAB, the stress unit tensor, should go to zero at a certain rate. Of course, if you have vacuum solution, the stress unit tensor is identical to zero. So, of course, I can put any n I want here. That will be regular. 
But for example, if you have Maxwell field in the Minkowski space time, in this construction, if I put a Maxwell field, you can check very quickly using conformal invariance of Maxwell's equation that the stress and tensor of Maxwell tends Maxwell field actually satisfies the condition omega to the minus one two times t has a smooth limit to sky here. Okay. So this is the condition. This is it. I mean, I'll just end of it. Now the surprising thing is something that um, that Lucas was hinting at that in this condition I never talked about null geodesics. Okay, and I'm not talking. The first definition that Penrose wrote down was called asymptotic simplicity. And that definition required that, and such that, every null geodesic of the physical space time has a future endpoint or a past endpoint, and the two things were called characters and timelines. <laughs> the definition that is given up here doesn't say any of that. Okay. And yet, this is sufficient. I have, to, I, have doctoral, I have to add some more conditions in a minute, but we'll do that. This is sufficient to talk about both gravitational radiation theory or any radiation theory and uh, also construct the positive and negative frequency solutions and Hilbert spaces uh, in quantum theory and also to talk about black hole theory, uh, the whole thing about defined black holes and such things. So this is something that is not entirely um, intuitive, but it's just true that one can actually do this in this <coughs> So the, 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 the disadvantage of Penrose's definition was that in any practical, if, you, if I give you a space-time, it was virtually impossible. I mean, it's very difficult to check that this space-time is actually asymptotically flat if, in fact, you have integrated every null geodesic and see if it has an endpoint on this graph. Right? It is just too much to do. I mean, you have, and furthermore, of course, if you have black holes, then it is even not true, right? Because black holes, some geodesics fall into the uh, black hole. So then he had a weakly asymptotically simple space times, which had to incorporate the fact that in black holes something else is happening and so on. Whereas here one doesn't have to distinguish it in, you know, the weakly asymptotic, uh, asymptotically simple and strongly asymptotically simple. One doesn't talk about asymptotic simplicity. One just talks about this. And, f and as I was telling you before, that there are complicated space times in which you can. I mean, it's not trivial, but you can check that in fact uh, it satisfies. These, um, uh, all these conditions, not just standard space time, like curved space time and so on, but, but, but uh, many more complicated space time. It's not trivial to know if a space time is asymptotically flat. I'm not saying that by any means at all. Very often, to know if it's asymptotically flat, you have to have some intuition about geodesics, but that is just a, your calculation intuition. At the end of the day, all you have to do is to check that this is true. And now the idea up here is to say that, okay, if I got this thing, then we want to say that scry plus is a part of the boundary such that no point, <coughs> which is to the future. So no point of the physical space time lies to the future of scry plus. So in Minkowski space time, then the statement would be that the total boundary would be this. And this, and no no point in the physical space time is the future of this. So therefore, this will be called scry plus in Minkowski space time. And scry minus is the same thing. You'll be the, the opposite of that. Part of space time such so that no point of m lies to the past time. Of scry minus. So every point of m up here is to the is, none of them lies to the past. And therefore, this is actually scry minus, as we just wrote before. I just like it in a, in a different color now. Um, and so this, now the idea would be, good, good, good. Now I know what I mean by asymptotically the boundary up here. And I can look at the causal past of this boundary. And I can see if, in fact, the causal past is all of space time or it's not all of space time. If it's not all of space time, then there's a black hole. If there is a all of space time, then there's no black hole. So we seem to be almost happy, but there's a problem. The problem is that you know, um, Lucas might come and say that, well, wait a minute. I'm just going to attach a boundary. I, we, here we're saying that you're given a space time, I've got a boundary such that. Lucas goes, says that, well, I'm going to uh, attach a boundary only to the future of u equal to u naught. Right? Sorry, to the past of u equal to u naught in Minkowski space time. This is it. That, because 
if I just look, I just stop my boundary up here, all these conditions are still satisfied because they were satisfied everywhere, so of course they are satisfied here. Uh, and then I'm going to say, that, well, I got this boundary and therefore this is sky plus. And now I want to say, wait a minute, look at the past of sky plus. Of sky plus. Does it contain, is it all of space time? Is it not all of space time? Of course it's not because this, this part is missing. But clearly we don't want to say this is a black hole, right? I mean, I, and so this is a very simple point, but this was something that was missing in the original definition that Penrose gave. He never talked about completeness of scrap. And, um, and then Garrosh and Horowitz pointed out that completeness of scrap is something that is important. And it's, it's important for this very simple reason, but we have to put that. And, and the reason I'm saying, emphasizing this so much is because in many of the discussions of semi-classical gravity and Hawking evaporation, this is the point that people miss. They say something is a is, 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 is the event horizon, but in fact it's not an event horizon of, of this black hole. It's not because sky is not complete, so it really is not not quite right. So let me just say now. So therefore, now next. Point. So <laughs> I just explain in words. I would like to write it down because this is an important point. What I've said so far is that you have a notion of asymptotic flatness up here, but the, this is not quite enough because of this. Um, the, this, this silly problem, if you like, that sky may not be complete. But you say, oh, of course, you should just reply that. No, I wish it would. Lucas, come on, you can't stop here, you should have to go up here. But the Lucas comes back and says, what do you mean by I cannot stop here? What is your condition which prevents me from stopping here? And now we have to write down this condition, not for Minkowski's space time, but for the general space time. So we want, what do you want to say? So the idea up here is that So remember that omega equal to zero on sky, and therefore, I'm sorry. Yeah, let me say. Therefore, it, it is clear that an A, if I just define NA to be equal to ground A, <coughs> is normal to sky. Now, the statement that so I, I'm. I'm, I'm doing some in-between manipulations. So now I, I would like to know what kind of normal is it? Is scry a null surface, then the normal is also tangential to it. Is it a space-like surface in which the normal is time-like and scry is space-like? Or is it a time-like surface, then the normal is going to be space-like and the surface is time-like? What kind of is it? So what, what kind of normal is this? This is what we want to find out. And luckily, these this little conditions that we had they suffice to tell you what kind of normal it is. Namely, what we know is that we do conformal transformation. <coughs> so I'm working my way to completeness. I just missed one step before, so I'm trying to fit it in, and then we'll come, come back to completeness. So we have to look at conformal transformation, namely, where g hat ab is omega squared times g ab. And therefore, I can, re, re, I can express the curvature tensors of g hat in terms of the curvature tensor of g. Now, how do we do that? Well, to, first we began with the fact that I got a derivative operator. There is a unique torsion-free derivative operator which kills this metric. And similarly, there is a unique torsion-free derivative operator which kills this metric. I got I got a covariant derivative compatible with G and com covariant derivative compatible with G hat up here. How are the two related to each other? Well, if I take any two derivative operators, then the difference between them is a tensor. That, that, is, a, that is the meaning of you know, the, the affine connection, if you like. The difference between two derivative operators is really a tensor. And this tensor is some CABC times KC. And you can now substitute graph hat of g, g hat a b equal to zero. So, so just put here g hat a b, then write omega squared, then use the fact that ground of omega, uh, uh, ground of g equal to zero, you expand it all out, and you just find quickly that in fact c a b c is a simple form. It is minus omega to the minus one times um, two times delta. <laughs> minus, minus 
Aqui o ômega. Whether indices are raised and lower with the with the metric g hat. So every time there is a hat, indices are raised and lower with the g hat. So this is the case, and then we also know that the Riemann tensor is just defined by grad A grad B of Kc. Two times that is the Riemann tensor R A B C D A D, and similarly R hat A B C D is defined by two times grad hat A. Same, same, same formula is true, so that defines that. Now I know what I can express grad hat in terms of grad, and therefore I can express the Riemann tensor here in terms of this Riemann tensor up here. Those of you who want to see some details in the textbook by Wall, there's an appendix which is called conformal transformations, where you will see the details worked out. But for our purposes, the details, details are not important, only the structure is important. The structure is that the Metric G, G hat is related to G by a conformal scale factor, and therefore its curvature tensors are also related by a conformal factor. When you work it out, you find that R um, is equal to omega squared R hat um, plus 6 omega times ground hat A and hat A minus um, 12. Now at omega equal to zero, that's where what we're interested in. This term is not is zero, this term is zero because everything is assumed to be smooth. Therefore, the n hat a in hat a, the norm of this vector field is completely given by the value of r at, at uh, special infinity. And what is r at special infinity? Well, we use Einstein's equation. Um, so if I use this Einstein's equation, r a b minus one half r g a b equal to n pi g, then of course. Still, stationary tensor actually vanishes at infinity sufficiently fast. You can check that this is actually equal to zero at infinity uh, because it's regular there, and therefore it follows immediately that n hat a n hat a equal to zero at infinity. And yet, hat here just means equality at, at scrap. So if I take the limit to scribe, that omega is equal to zero, omega equal to zero, minus 12 and hat a and hat a is equal to this, but it's also zero, therefore I get this equal to zero. So therefore we conclude that scribe is a null surface. So this just follows from the general definition, the scribe is a null surface up here. Um, little side remark that if I had, in fact, a cosmological constant, if, in fact, the Einstein's equation was GAB plus lambda <coughs> GAB is equal to 8 pi G, that's GAB. We assume the same fall-off condition on GAB, but then I also have this lambda up here sitting up here. Then you can quickly check that, in fact, um, that, in fact, R is equal to 4 lambda plus uh, h bar times e b uh, times g e b and this this actually goes to zero for a couple of reasons because of the fall off of g a b that we assume and also g of a b has an omega squared and g at a b so that also goes to zero and so we find here that r is equal to four lambda so here in general we get here four lambda is equal to minus twelve and hat a and hat a so that will tell us that n hat a n hat a is equal to minus lambda by 3. So if lambda is positive, then n hat a is, is time-like, then scar is space-like. <coughs> and if lambda is less than 0, then n hat a is space-like, and therefore scar. Uh, this is normal, so if the normal is time-like, then the surface to which is normal is space-like. If the normal is space-like, then the surface to which it is normal is time-like. This surface is normal, it's time-like up here. 
So these are respectively the asymptotically desitter space times instead of asymptotically flat and asymptotically anti desitter space time. In which in one case a null, null boundary is time like, in the other case it's space like, and when lambda equal to zero it is equal to zero. <coughs> and this difference between space like, time like, and null is very critical in the radiation theory. And one of the reasons why things can be, have been done to a great extent in the string theory literature for anti desitter space time is because sky is time like that. If it is space like, many of those constructions just don't go through. You do not have, for example, the DS CFT correspondence as you have for ADS CFT correspondence. And that is really quite related to the simple thing of that the two things are quite different from each other. But for our purposes, we're interested in the null case, where lambda is equal to zero, asymptotically flat case, then this is. Now, so it is null, so we go back up here. We have to talk about completeness of SCRA. And what we have seen now is that a normal to SCRA is null, and null surfaces are the property that the normal is also tangent to SCRA. Right? So since so SCRA is null, So it's also tangent to sky up here. So now the statement is that we want to know what do we mean by completeness of sky. This is the question that we are looking at. What is it? So what you now want to say is that sky is complete if this vector field n hat a is complete. Now what do I mean by a vector field is complete? It just means this affine parameter. U defines such that this is equal to 1, then U is goes from minus infinity to infinity. That is what we mean by complete scrap here. So this looks well okay. So now finally we are done, but we're not. The reason is because this is still not quite okay. The reason is because n hat a is not canonical. You see, the physical metric is canonical. But to construct the G hat AB, I have to introduce an extra ingredient, which is the mathematical ingredient, which is omega. And I could choose one omega, and you could choose some other omega. And then the, when, when I choose these different omegas, <coughs> since NA is ground omega, NA changes. So who is complete? Is my N complete, or is your N complete? That is a question. So the question is really which N? Which n hat a? So this is a problem. Which which n hat a are we going to say that is complete? And the answer to this is not. I, I'm just going to tell you the answer. If you have questions, I'll answer them. But I don't want to sort of tell how one people arrived at this conclusion. But which n hat? Well, the idea is here is of something very simple, namely that look at what we have is this n hat a, and we can demand that this n hat is divergence free. If n hat a is divergence free, so first of all, we can always make, let me rewrite it, we can always make by conformal transformation. What are the conformal transformations that are allowed? Instead of big omega, I can use big omega times little omega. <coughs> then little omega is smooth <coughs> and non-zero. That's scrap. If I do that, then if an omega is equal to zero, omega prime is equal to zero, and the second condition that is non-zero is required because we want grad A omega to be equal to not to be equal to zero and grad A omega prime also not to be equal to zero. And that's why that is satisfied if little omega is not equal to zero. So we can always make this divergence free by this conformal transformation. And the statement is that, but you can just choose omega. 
It is simple exercise, but you can just check that. We can choose omega such that we can add a, we can add a prime is equal to zero. So this is called, um, this choice is often called divergence free. And follow the frame. This is often called divergence free confound frame. It's a choice of omega. We're restricting our choice of omega. <coughs> and then the restricted freedom is just omega goes to omega prime, which is little omega times omega, such that you gain of little omega equals zero. In other words, little omega is constant as you go up and down scry. So little omega is a function of only t times phi angle and does not depend on u. It does not depend on u, it's just this li n, and, and that's because n li n is just you know, the vector field n hat a. Vector field n hat a is just d by the u n. The vector field which goes up and down. So there is a subtlety. I mean, the original definition that was given by Penrose was in terms of asymptotic simplicity and weak asymptotic simplicity. It had some, I mean, a slight conceptual limitation. Practically, it is also limited because it is difficult to check that all what happens to all my geodesics. But when once that is done, then we got sky complete. So then the statement is that now we are almost there. Except for one last subtlety, but we're almost there now. So the statement is now that we say that a space time MGAB and asymptotically flat space time. So space time which satisfies all these conditions. Is said to be asymptotic with Gaussian is called asymptotic with Gaussian because it just to make sure that we are not forgotten part of scra in Minkowski space we our construction gave us complete scra and in general also we got this complete scra <clears throat> so it's said to be asymptotic in Minkowskian if in a divergence free and common frame and has a is complete. This ensures that, you know, I could not have, I should not have forgotten part of space, been careless and just got part of sky plus. I really, I worked hard enough to get all of sky plus. That's what, that's what I had to do. Again, <coughs> that is to say, divergence free and formal frame means grad hat a n hat a equal to zero at scry. And the point is that if in fact we got, if n hat a is complete, If n hat a is complete, and then you define omega prime to be equal to omega omega, such that such, <coughs> it, such that this uh, this is also true. So that n hat prime <laughs> is also divergence free. Uh, then you can check that completeness of implies completeness of an idea prime. And the reason just is because V, the, sorry, U, the, 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 the affine parameter of n hat will be related to 
the affine parameter of, of n just by a function. So it's just a function of theta and phi, and therefore if u goes from minus infinity to infinity, u prime also goes from minus infinity to infinity. So we don't have any problem, so this is just a parenthetical remark up here, which completes here, namely that I said in a, in a divergence-free conformal frame, n heading is complete, and the statement is that once you have done it for one conformal frame, you can stop. You don't have to worry about whether it is true in all conformal frames which are divergence-free because it's automatically true in every conformal frame which is divergence-free. Sorry, what was the definition of completeness for the yeah. frame? Yeah, so, so n hat complete. It means it's affine parameter u goes from minus infinity to infinity, where u is affine parameter. So it's affine parameter. So that's completeness definition of any vector field. Uh, just does without even a metric, right? I mean, if you just go manifold and vector field, you say is it vector field complete? If in fact it's affine parameter runs from minus infinity to infinity. Yeah, affine parameter does not need a metric. Just a metric. Can I ask you a quick question yeah. about that also? That, that makes it sound very coordinate dependent. <clears throat> Which one? Uh, the, the definition of completeness in terms of you put an affine parameter on it and you ask for the full range. And so is there a more coordinate independent geometrical way of saying that completeness? Um, that, that, this is a practical way of talking about completeness. Um, so a vector field is complete. If it's affine parameter is complete. Um, I, I think if you are, for example, vector, uh, in the Riemannian case, you can say the length of the curve is complete, integral curve is complete. In the null case, you cannot say that. Uh, I, I don't think it's coordinate dependent in the sense that. Um, I, I you know, kind of understand that it's not. I was because it doesn't it depend on coordinate of the manifold, it is some structure. Given any vector, <coughs> it is born with a family of affine parameters. So, in that sense, it is not. A, it's just like given a metric, it is born with a torsion free derivative operator. So in, 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 this, in the same sense, but yeah, you're, you're right. I, mean, I think you really, really. But this is the thing that we use in order the differential equations, for example. Okay, so we're almost we're done up here. Um, yeah, I think that I should. Um, there's one small point. So now the question is, well, what is black hole? So we'll, I'll just finish this little thing next time. So the black hole is really you're given this asymptotic in Gaussian space time. You look at sky plus, which is all the future points in the boundary. You look at their complete past. And the question is now, is the complete past all of space-time or is it not all of space-time? If it is all of space-time, we would like to say that there is a black hole. Uh, there is no black hole. If it is part of space-time, then we would like to say that there is a black hole. But I just confess that there is still one small caveat, uh, which I'll fill next time. It is a quick one, uh, that, that for I hope to do it today, but we will not have time. I'll fill that next time. It's, it's a very small caveat, and then, then we'll be done. Then we'll have a notion of what a black hole is, and this is a notion that is used everywhere, right? And when people talk about black hole, it could be, uh, you know, black hole mechanics, black hole. Yeah. Um, and then, asymptotic in asymptotic in flight, asymptotic in etc., etc. et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So again, <coughs> office hours are on Friday. The homework is due on Monday, for those who are taking a class for credit. And um, uh, any other time, please stop by.